From a secret location in Hollywood, it's the Tom Likas Show. Give me a darn break. And now, and now, here he is, Tom Likas. Thank you for tuning into the Tom Likas Show. This is where America gets together to talk around about the issues you really care about. It's a different kind of radio talk program. We're the Radio Talk Show. It is not hosted by a right-wing wacko or a convicted felon. No! I am your host. Write down our telephone number. You're going to need it. It's 1 800 5 800 Tom. 1 800 5 800 866. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for being part of our program. Here we are together again on the radio. I want to get right into this. Uh, a listener sent me an article from Atlantic Monthly. When we get around to it, we'll post it on our website. But I want you to hear this article. Because, boys, those of you falling in love ought to hear what the other side is thinking sometimes when you're falling in love with them. I would put this column under the uh, the same file folder of reasons not to get married. This article is all the proof you need. Of course, I keep giving you more. This one is called, and again, she's talking about you, Poindexter. This one is called The Case for Settling for Mr. Good Enough by Lori Gottlieb in the Atlantic Monthly. Here it is. About six months after my son was born, he and I were sitting on a blanket at the park with a close friend and her daughter. It was a sunny summer weekend and other parents and their kids picnic nearby. Mothers munching berries and lounging on the grass. Fathers tossing balls with their giddy toddlers. My friend and I, who in fits of self-empowerment, had conceived our babies with donor sperm. Because we hadn't met Mr. Wright yet, surveyed the idyllic scene. Ah, this is the dream, I said, and we nodded in silence for a minute that burst out laughing. In some ways... I meant it. We'd both dreamed of motherhood, and here we were, picnicking in the park with our children. But it was also decidedly not the dream. The dream, like that of our mothers and their mothers from time immemorial, was to fall in love, get married, and live happily ever after. Of course, we'd be loath to admit it in this day and age, but ask any soul-bearing 40-year-old single heterosexual woman what she longs for in life most. And she probably won't tell you it's a better career or a smaller waistline or a bigger apartment. Most likely, she'll say that what she really wants is a husband. And by extension, a child. To the outside world, of course, we still call ourselves feminists and insist, vehemently even, that we're independent and self-sufficient and don't believe in any of that damsel in distress stuff. But, in reality, we aren't fish who can do without a bicycle. We're women who want a traditional family. And despite growing up in an era with a centuries-old mantra to get married young was... Finally, and it seemed refreshingly replaced by encouragement to postpone that milestone in pursuit of high ideals, education, career, but also true love. Every woman I know, no matter how successful and ambitious, how financially and independently secure, finds herself occasionally with desperation. If she finds herself at 30 and unmarried, oh, I know, she says, I'm guessing there are single 30-year-old women reading this right now who will be writing letters to the editor to say that the women I know aren't widely represented, right, representative, that I've been co-opted by the cult of the feminist backlash, and basically that I have no idea what I'm talking about. And all I can say is if you're not worried, either you're in denial or you're lying, 
In fact, take a good look in the mirror and try to convince yourself that you're not worried. Because you'll see how silly your face looks. <laughs> when you're being disingenuous. <laughs> see, I've been telling you this stuff, and, and a lot of you don't believe me. Whether you acknowledge it or not, there's good reason to worry. Now listen to this. I mean, this woman who calls herself a feminist, she's essentially saying in femspeak the exact thing I say. She says, by the time 35th birthday brunch celebrations roll around for still single women, serious, irreversible life issues masquerading as jokes creep into public conversation. These are comments like, well, I don't feel old, but my eggs sure do, or... Maybe this year I'll marry Todd. I'm not getting any younger. The birthday girl smiles a bit too widely as she delivers these lines, and everyone laughs a little too hard for a little too long, not because we find these sentiments funny, but because we're awkwardly acknowledging how unfunny they are. At their core, they pose one of the most complicated, painful, and pervasive dilemmas most single women are forced to grapple with nowadays. Is it better to be alone or to settle? The writer says, my advice is this. Settle. That's right. Don't worry about passion or intense connection. Don't nix a guy based on his annoying habit of yelling bravo in movie theaters. Overlook his halitosis or abysmal sense of aesthetics. Because if you want to have the infrastructure in place to have a family... Settling is the way to go, Poindexter. I added Poindexter. Mm -hmm. Based on my observations, in fact, says the writer, settling will probably make you happier in the long run, since many of those who marry with great expectations become more disillusioned with each passing year. It's hard to maintain that level of zing when the conversation morphs into discussions about who's changing the diapers or balancing the checkbook. Obviously, I wasn't always an advocate of settling. In fact, it took not settling to make me realize that settling is the better option. And even though settling is a rampant phenomenon, talking about it in a positive light makes people profoundly uncomfortable. Whenever I make the case for settling, people look at me with creased brows of disapproval or frowns of disappointment, the way a child might look at an older sibling who just informed her that Jerry's kids aren't going to walk even if you send them money. It's not only politically incorrect to get behind settling, it's downright un-American. Our culture tells us to keep our eyes on the prize, while our mothers, who know better, tell us not to be so picky. And the theme of holding out for true love, whatever that is, look at the divorce rate, permeates our collective mentality. Even sitcoms, starting in the 1970s with the Mary Tyler Moore show and going all the way to Friends, feature endearing single women in the dating trenches. And there's supposed to be something romantic and even heroic about their search for true love. Of course, the crucial, crucial difference is that whereas the earlier series begins after Mary has been jilted by her fiancé, the more modern-day Friends opens as Rachel Green leaves her nice guy orthodontist fiancé at the altar simply because she isn't feeling it. But either way, in episode after episode, as both women continue to be unlucky in love, settling starts to look pretty darned appealing. Mary is supposed to be contentedly independent and fulfilled by her newsroom family. But in fact, her life seems lonely. Are we to assume that at the end of the series, Mary, by then in her late 30s, actually it was her early, was it her early 40s? Oh, no, Mary Tyler Moore was in her early 40s. The character was in her late 30s. Found her soul mate after the lights in the newsroom went out and her work family was disbanded. If her experience was anything like mine or that of my single friends, it's unlikely. And... While Rachel and her supposed soulmate, Ross, finally get together for the umpteenth time in the finale of Friends, do we feel confident that she'll be happier with Ross than she would have been had she settled down with Barry, the orthodontist, ten years earlier? She and Ross have passion, but have never had long-term stability, and the fireworks she experiences with him but not with Barry might actually turn out to be a liability, given how many times their relationship has already gone up in flames. 
It's equally questionable whether Sex of the City's Carrie Bradshaw, who cheated on her kind-hearted and generous boyfriend Aiden, only to end up with the more exciting but self-absorbed Mr. Big, will be better off in the framework of marriage and family. Sometime after the breakup, when Carrie ran into Aiden on the street, he was carrying his infant in a baby Bjorn. Can anybody imagine Mr. Big walking around with a Bjorn? When we're holding out for deep romantic love, we have the fantasy that this level of passionate intensity will make us happier. But marrying Mr. Good Enough might be an equally viable option, especially if you're looking for a stable, reliable life companion. Madame Bovary may not see it this way, but if she'd remained single, I'll bet she would have been even more depressed than she was while living with her tedious but caring husband. What I didn't realize when I decided in my 30s to break up with boyfriends I might otherwise have ended up marrying is that while settling seems like an enormous act of resignation when you're looking at it from the vantage point of a single person, once you take the plunge and do it, you'll probably be relatively content. It sounds obvious now, but I didn't fully appreciate back then that what makes for a good marriage isn't necessarily what makes for good romantic relationship. Once you're married, it's not about whom you want to go on vacation with. It's about whom you want to run a household with. Marriage isn't a passion fest. Oh, see there, marriage? That, that's, a, that's a phrase I want you to remember, Mr. Good Enough. Marriage isn't a passion fest. This is why you're not getting sex, boys, those of you who are married, because many women think like this woman. Marriage isn't a passion fest. It's more like a partnership formed to run a very small, mundane, and often boring nonprofit business. Who told you that that's what marriage is? Marriage is a corporation. Who, who said that? Yeah. All right. Now we're getting to the nub here. She says, and I mean this in a good way. I don't mean to say that settling is ideal. I'm simply saying that it might have gotten an undeservedly bad rap. As the only single woman in my son's mommy and me group, I used to listen each week to a litany of unrelenting complaints about people's husbands and feel pretty good about my decision to hold out for the right guy, only to realize that these women wouldn't trade places with me for a second, no matter how dull their marriages might be or how desperately they might long for a different husband. They, like me, would rather feel alone in a marriage than actually be alone. Because they, like me, realize that marriage isn't about cosmic connection. It's about how having a teammate, even if he's not the love of your life, is better than not having one at all. The couples my friend and I saw at the park that summer were enviable, but not because they seemed so in love. They were enviable because the husbands played with the kids for 20 minutes so their wives could eat lunch. Are you hearing this? Your wife doesn't love you. She doesn't feel passionate about you. She wants you to give her a break from child care. Do you hear what I'm telling you, boys? Says here in practice, my married friends with kids don't spend that much time with their husbands anyway between work and child care. And in many cases, their biggest complaint seems to be that they never see each other. So if you rarely see your husband, but he's a decent guy who takes out the trash and sets up the baby gear... And he provides a second income that allows you to spend time with your child instead of working 60 hours a week to support a family on your own. How much does it matter whether the guy you marry is the one? Isn't that romantic, boys? So those of you who suspect that you're nothing more than a wallet, you're a human wallet and a sperm donor, guess what? You are. And she's telling you this right in the article. She says, it's not that I've become jaded to the point that I don't believe in or even crave romantic connection. It's just that my understanding of it has changed. In my formative years, romance was John Cusack and I only sky and say anything. But when I think about marriage nowadays, my role models are the television characters Will and Grace, who, though Will was gay, so you're the gay friend, boys. Though Will was gay and his relationship with Grace was platonic, were one of the most romantic couples that I can think of. What I long for in a marriage is that sense of having a partner in crime. Someone who knows your day-to-day -day trivia. Someone who both calls you on your BS and puts up with your quirks. So what if Will and Grace weren't having sex with each other? How many long married couples are having much sex anyway? Are you hearing this, boys? Those of you who think you're supposed to be getting married, this is how women think about you. The piece goes on. I just want someone who's willing to be in the trenches with me, my single friend Jennifer told me, and I never thought of marriage that way before. 
Two of Jennifer's friends married men who Jennifer believes aren't even straight. And while Jennifer wouldn't have made that choice a few years back, she wonders whether she might be capable of it in the future. Maybe they understood something that I didn't, she said. Oh, my God almighty. What they understood is this. As your priorities change from romance to family, the so-called deal-breakers change. Some guys aren't worldly, but they'd make great dads. Or you walk into a room and start talking to this person who is five foot four and has an unfortunate nose, but he gets you. My long-married friend Renee offered this dating advice to me in an email. She said, I would say even if he's not the love of your life, make sure he's someone you respect intellectually, makes you laugh, appreciates you. I bet there are plenty of these men in the older, overweight, and bald category, which they all eventually become anyway. She wasn't joking. A number of my single women friends admit in hushed voices, and after I swear I won't use their real names here, that they'd readily settle now, but wouldn't have ten years ago. They believe that part of the problem is that we grew up idealizing marriage, and that if we had more realistic understanding of its cold, hard benefits, we might have done things differently. Instead, we grew up thinking that marriage meant feeling some kind of divine spark, so we walked away from uninspiring relationships that might have made us happy in the context of a family. All marriages, of course, involve compromise, but where's the cutoff? Where's the line between compromising and settling? And at what age does that line seem to fade away? Choosing to spend your life with a guy who doesn't delight in the small things in life might be considered settling at 30, but not at 35. By 40, if you get a cold shiver down your spine at the thought of embracing a certain guy, but you enjoy his company more than anyone else's, is that settling or making an adult compromise? Take the date I went on last night. The guy was substantially older. He had a long history of major depression and said, in reference to the movies he was writing, I'm fascinated by comas and I have a strong interest in terrorists. He'd never been married. He was rude to the waiter, but he very much wanted a family and he was successful, handsome and smart. And as I looked at him from across the table, I thought, yeah, I'll see him again. Maybe I could settle for that. But my very next thought was, well, maybe I could settle for better. It's just like musical chairs. When do you take a seat, any seat, so you're not left standing alone? Back when I was still convinced I'd find my soulmate, I did, although I never articulated this, have certain requirements. I thought that the person I married would have to have a sense of wonderment about the world, would be both spontaneous and grounded, and would acknowledge that life is hard, but also be able to navigate its ups and downs with humor. Many of the guys I dated possessed these qualities, but if one of them lacked a certain degree of kindness, another didn't seem emotionally stable enough, and another's values clashed with mine. Others were sweet but so boring that I preferred reading during dinner to sitting through another tedious conversation. I also dated someone who appeared to be highly compatible with me. We had much in common and strong physical chemistry. But while our sensibilities were similar, they proved to be a half note off, so we never quite felt in harmony or never viewed the world through quite the same lens. Now, though, I realize if I don't want to be alone for the rest of my life, I'm at the age where I'll likely need to settle for someone who is settling for me. That's true. What I and many women hold who hold out for true love forget is that we won't always have the same appeal we may have had in our 20s and early 30s. Having turned 40, I now have wrinkles, bags under my eyes, and hair in places I didn't know hair could grow on women. Now, boys, listen to what she's saying about herself, and you tell me if you want to get married to this, okay? With my non-working life consumed by thoughts of potty training and play dates, I've become a far less interesting person than the one who went on hiking adventures and performed at comedy clubs. But when I chose to have a baby on my own, the plan was that I would continue to search for true connection afterward. It certainly wasn't that I would have a baby alone only to settle later. After all, wouldn't have been wiser to settle for a higher caliber of not Mr. Right while my marital value was at its peak? Those of us who choose not to settle in hopes of finding a soulmate later are almost like teenagers who believe they're invulnerable to dying in a drunk driving accident. We lose sight of our mortality. We forget that we, too, will age and become less alluring. And even if some men do find us engaging and they're ready to have a family, they'll likely decide to marry someone younger with whom they can have their own biological children.
which is all the more reason to settle before settling is no longer an option. So she's recommending this to younger women than herself. She's 40. And she's recommending that younger women settle for somebody like you, you boob. She says, I'll be the first to admit that there's something objectionable about making the case for settling because it's based upon the premise that women's biological clocks place them at the mercy of men. And they do. And that, therefore, a power dynamic dictates what an affair solely of the heart, not the heart and the ovaries. Oh, what should be an affair solely of the heart, not the heart and the ovaries. But I'm not the only woman who accepts settling as a valid choice. Apparently, so do the millions who buy best-selling relationship books that advocate settling, but that so as not to offend, simply spin the concept as a form of female empowerment. Now, she goes on here to talk about all these books and all the recommendations and all the advice, and I could go on and on, but you can go to our website, blowmeuptom.com, and read this piece. She is telling women to settle. So when a woman wants you to marry her, here's how they see you. You're not as interesting as the guy she slept with before. You're boring. You're reliable. You show up on time. You play with the kid. You take some of the uh, labor off her hands. You pay 60% of her income. That's how women see you. A sperm donor, a human wallet, and a babysitter. That's how they see you. This article is just another prime example of why men should avoid getting married. Because this is how we are seen. We are seen as potential helpmates in a very boring and bland scenario concocted by women. And, of course, uh, they're already telling you it's going to be passionless or relatively passion-free. Why would anybody want to be getting married under those conditions? one 800 5800 one 800 Some like it. I'm from Mexico, and uh, this is pretty much the best show I have ever heard in my life. My English is not that good, but when you show, I learn a lot of English. Oh, so tell us some of the English phrases you learned here. Um, thumbs up, bitch. <laughs> and, uh, pretty much just phrases like that. It's the Tom Likas Show. the Tom Likas show. Uh, read this piece that we read to you here on the air called The Case for Settling for Mr. Good Enough by Lori Gottlieb of Atlantic Monthly. Uh, cut our website. We'll link you to it. You uh, may have some opinions about this. I think any man who's thinking about getting married needs to see this. At one eight hundred five eight hundred Tom, that's our telephone number. Tina on the Tom Likas show. Hello. 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 Hi, Tom. Yes. <laughs> well, you sure told me. One eight hundred five eight hundred Tom. That's our telephone number. Here's Lisa. Uh, the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Hello, Tom. It's nice to talk with you. I know. I, I totally disagree with this writer. For one thing, instead of instead of spending all of your time settling for somebody else and dealing with their minor irritations, why don't you concentrate on making yourself a happier person by being comfortable with yourself? Well, I think what she's saying here is not uh, that she uh, just uh, has this need to be with a person. I think she's saying she needs somebody's income. She says it right in the article. She needs somebody to help with child care. She needs somebody to help her out. That's what she needs. Oh, but there's so many people that think that having a child and having somebody else in the house is going to make them a complete and happy person. If more people are content with themselves, they're going to find out they don't need to add to the human race, and they could provide for themselves and be much happier than putting up with other people. Well, I, you know what? I agree with that, and uh, I don't feel the least bit sorry for these women who go to the sperm bank and get themselves artificially inseminated, and then they write these big, weepy articles about how they haven't met anybody or they don't have anybody, or maybe they should have just settled for one of the guys they met over the boo-hoo freaking who. 
I happen to agree. So my point here is to any of the other women that are considering that they need to settle, maybe you just need to sit back and realize what you actually need or want for your life and be more reliant on yourself. You're going to find out you're happier than dealing with somebody who doesn't put the toilet seat down or doesn't take the trash out when you want them to. Take care of yourselves and be a good human being, and you're actually going to attract a better lifestyle. Yeah, well, these women who complain about the toilet seat being left up and uh, who does the housework and when you're going to take out the garbage, they are letting you know that they settled for you. They are le- that. That is the anger coming out. That is the passive aggressive behavior of somebody who is miserable. Well, I'm glad you are telling these guys that they don't need to be putting up with this BS. And as another woman who is nobody single, needs to. By the way, by the way, by the way, nobody, nobody needs to put up with BS. If the other person isn't uh, satisfactory to you, leave today. Stop right. trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Stop telling the other person what to do. I completely agree, but any woman of any age, don't settle for anything. First, be the best you possibly can for yourself, and then everything else will fall into place. You don't have to worry about trying to... Well, in my case, I learned to love me more than anybody on the planet. And now, I don't need anybody in my life. I don't need anybody living in my house. I don't need to be married. I don't need children. I don't need pets. I am perfectly happy on my own. Anything else that comes into my life is gravy. I have a completely fulfilling, enriching life on my own. Plenty of friends. I have family members. Uh, and but, I can but, enjoy I, my alone time by myself in my home, decorated the way I want to, and I don't have to put up with something. I else refuse to be anybody's uh, Poindexter that they settle for. I refuse. Well, and if that's, you, that's uh, by the way, by refusing him. to spend money on women, that's the first step towards not becoming Poindexter. That's true. I agree with you. But thank you for telling them. And let's let the women know that they don't have to have a man to become the best they can possibly be as well. Yeah, a lot of them have bought on this idea that they have to have children. They have to do it. They have to do it. They have to do it. Or they have to be married, have to be married, have to be married. Well, I just wanted to throw my two cents in as a 42-year-old But this just proves this proves that women who are always pushing to get married are pushing for half of your wealth men they are pushing to have, have the have to become half owners of your corporation that's what they're pushing for well thank you for the time tom and keep doing what you're doing i enjoy listening to you lisa thank you for the call tom like us 1-800-5800-TOM 1-800-5800-866 i took your advice staunchly and i've been dating lots of different girls and banging all kinds of chicks if you only knew, more ass than a toilet seat. Love that. Oh, jeez. It's the Tom Likas Show. It's the Tom Likas Show. one 800 800 tom That's our telephone number. It all started with a piece of Atlantic Monthly that a listener sent in. It's called The Case for Settling for Mr. Good Enough. Written by somebody named Lori Gottlieb. And uh, it's another example of why men should not get married because uh, it, it tells you everything you need to know about how women see you as a marriage partner is in this article. And I'm telling you, once you read it, you'll be disgusted and you will never, ever want to marry anybody. 1-800-5800-TOM. That's our telephone number. Vinny on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Hey, Tom. So I, I think I might have been the guy responsible for sending you this article a couple of weeks ago. And what I found so fascinating about the article, which is rather long, was the end of it. She she really realize, she realizes what she's doing. Because here at the end of the article, which I don't know if it was because of time, you didn't have enough time to get to it, but... No, if I read that whole article, it would have taken up the entire hour. <laughs> Indeed. The, um, if, if you wouldn't mind, i just read the last paragraph here. She, she says that never married moms don't get the night off. At the end of the evening, we rush home to pay the babysitter, make any house guests tiptoe around and speak in a hushed voice, because, of course, we wouldn't want Junior to know what was going on, and then wake up at 6 a.m. with the first cries of mommy. And the last line of her article is, try bringing a guy home to that. <laughs> she knows. She and it's, exa- it's exactly what I've been telling that about uh, being with single mothers. It's exactly what I've been telling you. 
And, it, and it's funny because I think men are starting to realize this because if you go back to the, the article that you read from Reason Magazine on why people are having uh, fewer kids, ki- having fewer kids, or how about that article by uh, Kay Heimowitz on the child man, you know, rearing yes. the child man. Where all men who refuse to grow up and mature, yes. We're sitting around and playing Halo 3 and pimping chicks at the bars, banging chicks left and right and living your life as a single person. All of a sudden, these women are starting to find out that guys are, are catching on to their little, you know, their little ways of going about this. And now we're not, we're, we're starting to have fewer kids. You had that researcher, uh, uh, Daniel uh, Gilbert from uh, the Harvard, you know, he did the happiness. Yes. Research. You know, he found in all his research that... That the people that uh, that, that the, uh, where's it at? In addition, the more children a person has, the less happy they are. And it it seems to me that a lot of uh, women in their 30s and 40s, like the Kay Heimowitzes and the Lisa Gottliebs out there, are starting to uh, you know they're starting to get a little worried that that it didn't turn out to be that Cinderella story that they expected it to be. And some of them went out and got the the turkey basting treatment, like Miss Gottlieb, and now has a problem sitting out at parks. Uh, watching other fathers munch berries and plays with their kids. So she's not going to, you know, just settle for the guy she's been going for, the, the, the badass, the hardcore dude, or, you know, the jerk, as you put it. No, no, now it's time to uh, pay attention to the guy that might be a little funny looking, might have uh, never had a girlfriend his entire life and saved her money or saved his money. Now she's going to settle for that. And don't you think sooner or later the guy's going to catch on? If you're one of these idiots that are going to settle down and marry you know, these girls that sooner or later you're going to figure out that you were just Mr. Good Enough, and then you're going to get reprimanded when you uh, get caught looking on the outside yourself. And, and there are men right now listening to this program who are Mr. Good Enough, and maybe only now their eyes are opening to see that they were just treated in this manner, that uh, uh, the women they are with feel like they had to settle for somebody and tag your it. You got it, buddy. Thank you, Vinny. And then uh, Artie got a bong hit for me? Of course he does. Go ahead, Artie. (coughs) Guy's awfully familiar with you, Artie. 1 800 5 800 Tom. That's our telephone number. It's Joe on the Tom Likas show. Hello. Hello, Tom. My question is. If all she wants is someone to do the babysitting, someone to help her pay the bills, why doesn't she move in with her friend she's in the park with? They can both take care of both of their kids. It's just too logical. Yeah, Heather has two mommies. Go ahead. <laughs> the other, the other single moms. That's right. Form a corporation together. You know why they don't want to do it? Because no woman would accept a bad deal like that. Well, not only that, but if the deal goes sour, she can't take half her money. That's exactly right. And that's what the real bottom line is. And that is why women push you to get married. They want you to be the one responsible for paying for everything, even if things don't work out. I keep trying to tell men this and tell men this. They don't see it. A lot of men are too young, and they say, well, I don't have anything. What could she possibly get out of me? But but you don't expect to have nothing for your entire life, do you? No, it's just it's ridiculous. You know, it's a, it's a no-lose deal for the woman, and it's a no-win deal for the man. That's right. Men have to start saying no, no marriage, no. Well, I'm, I totally agree with you. Could you blow me up, Tom? Of course I can. one 800 800 tom That's our telephone number. It's Cat on the Tom. Like his show. Hello. Hello, Tom. I love your show. <laughs> Why, thank you. I just wanted to say that first before I just rail on this woman. I'm 25, and I'm happy, and I'm successful. And what's so bad about being happy on your own? I, did you As like someone who is happy on my own, I agree with you. I mean, that first caller, I was so glad she called because she was in her 40s, and I listen to your show almost every day, and I rarely hear a chick call and say, hey, I'm happy, I'm single, woohoo!" You know? So if I By the way, I hear from too many guys who are unhappy being alone because they live with mommy until the last possible minute, and then they want somebody else to fold their socks. And only after they uh, spend a lot of money and time with a woman do they find out that the American women don't fold socks anymore. They don't make coffee. They don't make dinner, breakfast, or lunch. They don't want to do anything around the house. They just want you to pay for everything. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't get that. I mean, the time that I get not having a boyfriend, I, you know, got an amazing paying job working my ass off. And now I can have so much more. It just, it seems to have so much more benefits if you focus on making yourself happy. Now, if you had to have a kid and say, I start thinking about human rights. Hey, 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 we can't say that on the air. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm so sorry. Can't say that. Okay, well, if I'm thinking with my clock and I have to have a kid, well, yes. Why not? For example, as I always as I always say, dear, if you were a rooster, you could call in and say cock a doodle do. You could oh. say that, <laughs> but that's about it. Right, right. Um, can I say pistol thinking with your pistol? Uh, I guess you're just in. Okay. Well, if I'm a girl and thinking with my clock, then and I have to have a kid because I just have to. Why not be single and move in with other moms and share the load? Right. <laughs> It's because they want a man to pay for everything. This is why women don't want to go to sperm banks. Not because they want to love a man. It's because they want a man to pay, pay, pay. Well, who pays in the end? The kid. If you can't afford it, you the can't The kid is just an accessory. The kid is just a... The kid is like owning a car, owning a nice piece of furniture. Well, I just want to tell all your amazing listeners out there... the. Don't settle, ever. That's ridiculous. Don't. Yeah. And I'm still so sorry. I hope these chicks realize that you don't have to live your life that way. How about you, you just decide, you know, if I can't meet somebody stupid enough to be my partner to raise children, maybe I just shouldn't be having children. Maybe I should find other ways to fulfill my life. Buy a poodle, uh, you know, become a shopping bag lady, uh, something. Uh, become the uh, the old spinster auntie that comes over with the gifts for her nieces and nephews. Why is it that these women insist on having kids and then complain about how hard their lives are? I don't know. I, I, I have the benefit of also having a godmother in my life who is an amazing woman, a uh, notorious bachelorette, um, and in her 50s is getting marriage proposals to her. Um and had you know way more than a six figure income, and started her own business on the side, and had you know poodles and friends over and luncheons and all these amazing things, and raised money for different organizations, and you know had fun to you know more fun than a person really deserves in one lifetime. And what's so bad about that? But I don't know. Maybe I should just have five kids instead. I agree with you, and I thank you for the call. One eight hundred five eight hundred Tom. That's our telephone number. Anthony on the Tom Like It Show. Hello. Hello, Tom. How are you doing? I'm doing Tom? great. Great. That's fantastic. Two words or uh, a couple of words. Cheaper to keep her. I'm in my forties, and a lot of my friends are in their forties, and I've got one friend going through divorce right now. It's costing him one point three million dollars. So you guys that are out there that are young and think you don't have anything, you know, you accumulate. And that's not a lot of money, but... Uh, you know, I know over. somebody, and he knows who he is. I won't say who he is. I know somebody out there who paid $20 million in a divorce. $20 million. Wow. $20 million. Yeah, I, uh, I've been married for over 21 years. I've got two great kids. You know, they're fantastic. And I've got a son that's 17, and I'm, te I'm teaching him the likest way. It's uh, easier to rent than to own. I mean, uh, you know, uh, just kind of keep him out of the fray. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yep. That's what you have to do. Yeah. And, and look at it now. Look at, uh, you know, there's another report that came out today. One in four teenage girls has some sort of venereal disease. Yeah. Hey, hey, you can't use that word on the air. Oh, I apologize. I'm sorry about that, Tom. I apologize. <laughs> Amazing stuff. Thank you for the call. Uh, I've got more to say about this. And if you do, call us at 1-800-5800-TOM. It's 1-800-5800-8. Six, six. You can also write us. Our email address is tom at blowmeuptom.com. The Tom Likas Show.